All right. So um, I want to review a little bit about what we did last time rather quickly. So um, the main idea of last time was that uh, given a cyclic A infinity uh, algebra, A, um, of uh, Calabi-Yau dimension D, so D will always stand for the Calabi-Yau dimension. Um, if you don't know what that means, is that the pairing somehow um, goes from A tensor A to K shifted, and I never remember if it's shifted, probably shifted by minus D, something like this. That's the meaning of D. Uh, if you started with the Calabi-Yau threefold, this D would be three. That's kind of the meaning. Um, the goal is to construct, uh, oh, sorry, and a splitting S of the Hodge filtration. Our goal is to construct now um, an element DAS in a special space called um, sim h bar completed of h minus double bracket h bar and lambda <coughs> where I need to explain quite a bit of the notation. Here h is the Hochschild homology of the algebra. Maybe shifted by d for good measure. Um, h minus, whenever I put a minus to any graded or dg vector space, I will mean um, h adjoined u inverse, where u is a special variable of degree minus two. I remind you that I'm using homological conventions, not cohomological conventions. And this will also be the degree of h bar and lambda. And um, this symbol sim h bar completed means, um, so I'm going to be a little um, imprecise, but I will mean invert h bar and complete the symmetric algebra in some way. You can read about the exact way in which it's completed in our paper. It's not very important. The most important thing is that um, expressions of the form um, exp of FAS over H bar uh, makes sense. And this is what our A, D of AS will be. It will be an expression of this sort um, where this FAS um, is itself some kind of formal power series that looks like FAS GN H bar to the G lambda to the two G minus two plus N. So um, that's the reason I need to invert H bar because I need to be able to write expressions of this sort. Um, and it's a little bit of a problem when I need to take exponential because I will get arbitrarily high negative powers of h bar. Um, so I cannot just take the usual um, localization at h of the symmetric h bar at, of the symmetric algebra, but I need to have some finiteness condition. But it's not, this can be perfectly made sense of in a fairly simple way. So I remind you again that the meanings of these ideas, of these things are U keeps track of um, psi class insertions. H bar keeps track of genus. And lambda keeps track of Euler characteristic. So somehow I think about this as the dual of the usual descendant potential where I would insert classes in the Hochschild homology or the usual cohomology of a symplectic manifold if my algebra came from a Foucault category. 
and I would try to, in, to, in, to invent some invariants that would depend on a genus, a number of mark points, and for that number of mark points, a bunch of insertions, each of which is a combination of um, a class in H and some psi class insertion. All right. So now let me give you the big idea of how this should be constructed and explain the problems with um, this idea. Uh, and this is all going back to Costello. This is definitely not our work for now. I will tell you where our work really begins. We're still essentially reviewing work of Costello. Um, the idea is that, um, the first idea is that we would like to solve a differential equation which um, this D of AS will satisfy. Or maybe this FAS. They are directly related. Uh, this taking the exponential of FAS divided by H bar is an invertible operation, essentially. Um, starting from a very simple initial condition. which fixes what only the zero three part of the potential is. So somehow that's um, what our starting point should be. We hope that this D of AS, which we've constructed, we, we, we've defined with great effort by combining all these things. The reason we combine things in such a complicated way is to get something that satisfies a differential equation. And if you're lucky, maybe the differential equation has a unique solution with, in, with this initial condition, and DAS will be the unique solution with this, um, uh, the unique solution with this initial condition. Now, the first new idea that I need to explain is that the differential equation will not happen in this um, space that I had before. Maybe let me give a name to this space. I will call this FH. This is following uh, partly the notation from Costello. F stands for Fox space, and you'll see in a second why. So it turns out that it's not a good idea to try to solve it in FH. There is no, in fact, not, not only, there is no differential equation in FH. But in a related space, which I will call FL, which is the same kind of completion um, the exact same construction, except that I replaced H with L, but now L is the Hochschild chains of A shifted by D. So before I was working at homology level, you remember that H was a Hochschild homology here. Now I'm replacing my Hochschild homology with the chain complex which computes Hochschild homology. So while this was a, this FH was a graded vector space in its most simple incarnation, this will now be a DG vector space. Because it inherits a differential. So all, all the operations that I'm doing are about um, equally well done with DG vector spaces or vector space or graded vector spaces. So there's um, once I do it with DG vector spaces to begin with, I get a DG vector space. Remember that this carries a differential, which is called B, the usual Hochschild differential, which I could write down, but it's not very illuminating. So this also has carries now a differential, which I will call also B. 
from all these constructions of taking uh, symmetric algebra, adding a variable u and so on. So the, the, the big idea here is what you should think of is we will work at chain level. So instead of doing stuff at homology level, we will work at chain level. Now, this should kind of make your hair stand on, on the back of your neck a little bit, because um, whenever we work at chain level, it's a very different story because um, there can be very many models for the things that you are working with. Um, homology has the advantage that in every model that you're computing it, it's the same. Like for example, if you do, um, I don't know, homology of a, of a topological space has a very clear meaning. But if you compute it in the singular homology model, you, your chains are something. And if you work it in the simplicial model, your chains are something completely different. So if you do constructions at chain level and you're not working only with homology, you could get very different results depending on the model. So somehow, uh, this should be, be uh, uh, a worrisome sta stage, and I will explain in a few minutes how that gets solved. But now we run into a problem, big problem. The initial condition does not determine a unique solution. of the differential equation in this space FL. So it would seem like all our hopes are lost because we, uh, we had set out to, this, to, to, to define this um, potential as uh, the solution of uh, the differential equation, but the, there's no unique solution. There can be many solutions and uh, if you then you don't have anything helpful to define. But here is the main idea. So solution to this problem is um, there is another very similar space, which maybe I will call FC similar to, F, to this FL, um, which is, um, maybe I will define what it is. It's direct sum over all G and N, singular chains on M, G, zero, N framed mod sigma N, minus double bracket H bar and lambda. Um, so uh, we've discussed last time what the framed moduli spaces are. I remind you it's, um, I, I think we discussed this, but let me recap it again. I'm parameterizing um, complex structures on a Riemann surface, which has some genus G and punctures and around each puncture, I choose a framing, in other words, a little uh, point on a, on a little circle, epsilon radius circle drawn around it. Or if you don't like that, one way to say it is take the real tangent space here and choose a ray in the tangent space at that point. Okay, so that's the framing of the moduli spaces. These are S1 to the N bundles over the usual MG zero N, which is nothing but MGN. The symmetric group action here is, I just mean I forget which point is marked one, two, three. I take topological uh, singular chains. So this means just singular chains. 
this minus means as before a join u inverse and the h bar and lambda are the same thing and maybe there's some kind of completion and let me not worry about the completion here um in which so in this new space we can write a a completely similar differential equation and here the solution is unique so this is the crucial point the fact that the solution turns out to be unique is a very easy fact about homologies of moduli spaces. But nevertheless, the fact we end up with a unique solution to this differential equation in FC. So then the next step is if, and this is a big if, the, the two-dimensional TFT rho a could be extended to these spaces mg zero n so remember that in my previous talk i said that um, k was supposed to be greater than or equal to one but now I'm, re I'm trying to do something with k equals to zero. Then what I could do is I can take this solution, which I will call, so let's, let's give a name to this solution. I will call it exp of v mod h bar. So take the image rho a of x of v over h bar and now that lives in fl so remember that what this function row this uh, this tft row a was doing it was mapping uh, chains on mg kl framed with some shift into home L tensor K L tensor L for our fixed A infinity algebra. Cyclic, this is what an A infinity algebra gives us. So when K is zero, so in particular, it will map chains on MG zero L framed into just L tensor L. And now taking the quotient of this um, by sigma n, sigma l, uh, this will give me symmetric tensors, obviously, because the action is respecting the, the symmetric group action. And then doing all these kind of fancy decorations of putting a minus h bar lambda replaces the left hand side by exactly the fc by fl so rho a really allows me to map each one of these terms to something in f all right um and i could take this image let me call it da so i have swept under the carpet one big issue, this big if here, that um, it is possibly difficult or maybe simply not possible at all to extend the TFT to the zero boundary. Um, all right. So this, if we did that, this would give us a special solution 
uh, whoop, yes, uh, um, a special solution. So maybe there isn't a unique solution of the differential equation, but there is one special one which somehow comes from the chains on moduli spaces. Let me stop here and pause to, to see if there are questions. Alessio asked me to try to make this more interactive. Let me see if up to this point there are any questions of, about this very general program that I have outlined. Is there any further motivation you can give us to why we should work at the chain level instead of homology? Uh, yes, because you will see that the operators, the differential operators that we need um, on this FC do not exist, do, they do not um, map closed chains to closed chains. So, um, if you were working at homology level, you would really need to only be ever working with closed chains. But there will be some operators on this FC that do not take closed chains to closed chains topologically. So that's kind of the end of your hope. Uh, it's just, um, uh, you're done there. Okay. I also want to ask a question. So yes. this uh, row A seems very mysterious. It uh, relates this FC to FL. Can you say something about that? Right, so the problem is that we don't know how to construct this row A for zero inputs. For more than zero inputs for K greater than or equal to one, this was constructed by Konsevich Seibelman and the idea may be, so let me just try to, uh, since this may be, not be so familiar to anyone, to most people, um, what is this row A in general? So the idea is we want to go from chains on moduli spaces of genus G with K inputs L outputs framed to um, home L tensor K L tensor L, and in such a way that whenever I sew things together on moduli spaces, the result re is composition of homomorphisms on the right-hand side. So the idea that uh, Konsevich, Seibelman, and Costello did um, it was to, uh, these guys can be described in terms of ribbon graphs. So I'm not going to tell you all the technical details, but there is, there is some combinatorial gadget called ribbon graphs, um, which produces a chain complex that is quasi isomorphic to this uh, topological complex of chains on moduli spaces. This is kind of very natural from the point of view of Strebel differentials. There's some, a lot of kind of classical complex differential G um, uh, quadratic differentials, something of that sort. On any Riemann surface with a particular choice of complex metric, you can draw a graph and with some additional decorations, you can arrange things to have inputs and outputs and the inputs and outputs can be sold. You can add a framing, everything. So you can have a ribbon graph with this uh, thing. And then the whole issue is to, given a ribbon graph to produce some kind of homomorphism here. And this is a recipe that Konsevich and Seibelman told us what to do, okay? I could write it down, but that's not particularly interesting. The moral thing that you should think about is that somehow this is a complete analog of the statement that we know that um, if we have a Frobenius algebra, so just a, a ring together with a pairing, forget about any A infinity business, um, that gives us a topological two dimensional TFT. So something that associates to a surface, something like this, a way to input here things in the center of the algebra 
and to read off here also something in the center of algebra of the algebra. Um, what uh, Costello proved following ideas of Konsevich was that this kind of non-chain level statement um, can be brought up to the chain level so we to the singular chains by making the algebra be richer be cyclic a infinity as opposed to just Frobenius just having a pairing and the multiplication now having a pairing and many multiplications and working with a with the Hochschild chain complex instead of just the center of a which is HH zero okay. or maybe upper zero there, there's no distinction between those two except the shift um, did I answer your question I am so what I am confused is that uh, usually in field theory there is already other chrome of Witten invariants and here your goal is to construct a chrome of Witten invariants for no but for this is uh, what 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 this does it gives the open sector of the field theory so what you should think of is um, you what what the a infinity algebra gives you is it gives you the open sector of the field theory and you're trying to recover the closed sector of the field theory which is what the gromov witten theory is i see so the open one is already given by this construction here exactly this row a captures the open sector if you want you can think about the what a disk with a bunch of insertions ah, i see so now what we want is kind of just like to glue these open things to form closed things. Exactly. I see. Thank yeah. you very much. But you should think about the disk with n insertions is exactly the a infinity multiplication combined with the pairing. I see. I so see. This, this corresponds to mk I see. blah 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 paired with one more item. I see. So the goal is really to make k to be zero. Uh, yes, the, the part of the problem is to make k to be zero, but also to glue things together. It's not at all obvious how to do it. I see. So for now, I'm going to ignore this technical point about whether the, um, the TFT can be extended to the case of zero inputs. But remember, we're still only the, the k equals to zero would only say that we can look at surfaces that look like this with zero inputs and an arbitrary number of outputs, but still only read off an open sector of it. We, can't, we, we cannot ever talk about things with just closed boundaries. Does this make sense? Yes. Right. We, we so, somehow the A infinity algebra gives us everything we need together, uh, the, the A infinity algebra together with this map row A gives us everything we need to read off things that look like surfaces with open boundaries. We are trying to allow ourselves to read off things with closed boundaries. That's what the gromov witten theory would be. All right, any more questions? Okay. So let's proceed now. Um, we, we will have now some kind of nice different solution to the differential equation if we pretend that this 2D TFT can be extended. But now there's another problem. So the problem is that because we were working at chain level, a solution of the differential equation is not B closed. So what we have done is we've constructed some element in this um, L uh, sim L. So we have our, our element now, um, this DA lives in here 
but because it's not B closed, so B of DA need not be zero, because it's not B closed, we cannot pass to homology. So we cannot um, use this element DA yet to take, so DA does not live in the homology of this FL, which would be FH. So we, this is where we want to end up. We want to end up in something that only cares about the homology, Hochschild homology. In particular, maybe let me emphasize that it should only care about uh, elements in, in the insertions that are B closed should not depend on their particular representative. So it's rather important that we do something about this, this because if we work with this DA, we're, we're kind of in trouble. But <clears throat> the, um, um, so far we have not used at all the splitting. So you might kind of, probably you haven't noted because I have swept a lot of details under the carpet, but this one only depends on A. It's, it's actually a very nice conceptual object because all this splitting business is a little bit un, un, unpleasant. And this DA is something that is just really um, intrinsic on A. So the solution to this is to say, well, actually DA is closed for another differential which I will write like this, B plus UB plus H bar delta. So there will be a differential on this space of this form. And if what, what I have is that this DA, if I apply this more complicated differential operator gives me zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to note that both this big B, which is the circle operator, and this delta, which will be a BV operator that I will explain, um, both of them are constructed from the circle action. So the main point here is that when I was drawing these um, chains on moduli spaces, I had a framing and I could rotate the framing around. So I could move my point here around. There's a circle action on each one of the boundary component of, of each one of the marked uh, points on the boundary. I told you that this is an S1 to the N bundle over the usual MGN. So, um, Clearly there's an S1 to the N circle action. Um, at the level of um, moduli spaces, this circle action is definitely not trivial. So it's impossible to trivialize it. But what we have done is we've passed from moduli spaces of curves to chains on the A infinity algebra. And on the A infinity algebra level, on L, this action is trivial is homotopically trivial. Um, and it, in fact, this splitting S is nothing but a trivialization of the circle action. And I will explain this in more detail in a few, uh, maybe in my next lecture. But if now I have somehow trivialize my B and my delta, I can, they're not strictly trivial, they're not zero, but they are zero, they're 
homotopically equal to zero. So if I have an operator that's homotopically equal to zero, I can try to make it strictly zero by a process called the homological perturbation then. So what I have, I will start with my DA, which is B plus, satisfies B plus U B plus H bar delta of DA equals to zero. And through a process called homological perturbation, I will end up with another element, which now satisfies B of it is zero. I have forced my B and delta, which were only homotopically zero, now they're exactly equal to zero. So I can take the homology. So this gives me an element in FH in, in my, okay? So this whole idea has been around ever since Costello's first paper. This is all, everything I've talked about so far is in Costello. Um, I want to tell you what the new papers do. So, by the way, they have been posted to the archive. You can find them by Googling out my name and uh, uh, the latest two papers. Um, what they do is they solve the difficulty uh, with row A not defined for K equals to zero. They um, give an explicit explicitly computable resolution of this space FC where the differential equation can be written, in fact, algorithmically. So I can write, solve this differential equation term by term on a computer in some huge vector spaces. And finally, that those two are the, uh, the first paper with, which has Kevin as well as a co-author. That was partly one of his ideas. And the, the last thing, the, the, the second paper is we explain how to use a Feynman type sum um, combined, combined with something called the given tall group action to do the homo, to do homological perturbation. Whoops. Homology, Ay. what is this? Homological perturbation. So this last step here, while I kind of seem to say it's a very easy thing, it's not. It's a, it's a long complicated sum over all kinds of complicated graphs. So let me stop here for a minute and see if there's any more questions. And before I begin something called explaining the Lagrangian formalism, which will tell you where the differential equation comes from. Any questions? All right, I seem to be explaining stuff so clearly there's no questions. Hmm. I don't know. All right, so let me try to explain. So now we're going to start a very different subject, which goes back to Givental, um, called the Lagrangian formalism. Um, which is just classical algebra and a little bit of homological algebra, but which will turn out to be very powerful. So let me begin with the simplest case, which is the non-DG case. We will need to do this in the DG case, which is much more interesting. But for now, let's begin with a very simple case. So let's say I have V is a symplectic vector space. 
And I have written my V as a decomposition, as an orthogonal decomposition um, into Lagrangians, into two Lagrangians. So the pairing is zero when restricted to L minus or L plus. I have a, I have a, um, uh, a skew symmetric pair. All right, so um, what do I do? The very first thing I do is I construct a Weyl algebra. This is a Weyl algebra of V, which is just I take the tensor algebra of V and mod out by the relations which say X tensor Y minus Y tensor X minus, I'm going to introduce an H bar va variable here, uh, H bar times the pairing of X and Y is zero. Um, and that uh, gives me a nice non-commutative algebra. Now I'm going to use the fact, so I have L plus is a subset of V. So I can take the left ideal generated by L plus and I can take the quotient. So I can take the quotient, which is called the Fox space. Um, which is the um, Weyl algebra of V divided by the left ideal generated by L plus. All right, not particularly interesting. Well, it is a bit interesting. Now, the important thing is that um, in this, uh, I, I, I do have a, a map from sim L minus into the Weyl algebra. And why is that? It's simply because when I look at the pairing, restricted to L minus gives me zero. So this relationship is just saying that elements of L minus commute with each other in the Weyl algebra. So I have a natural map this way. And now I can go further to the Fox space, which is a quotient of the Weyl algebra. And the statement, which is not hard to prove, is that this composition is a vector space isomorphism. So as vector spaces, not as Weyl algebra modules, but as vector spaces, the symmetric algebra and the Fox space are isomorphic. They're roughly the same size. The case we will be interested in um, but in the DG world. And there, something new and unexpected will happen. So let's try to repeat this in the DG world. I need to give myself a particularly interesting symplectic vector space. So here's uh, the idea. So let V now be a um, DG vector space, in other words, a complex. And I give myself two things, a symmetric pairing, again in the graded sense, um, symmetric, and also, and a circle action. What is a circle action on a DG vector space? So this, let me use this, the notation that we will use later on. The little b will be my 
uh, differential on the vector space. This is an arbitrary vector space. What is a circle action? This is an operator B from V to V shifted by minus one. So it increase, uh, yeah. So it increases homological degree. It goes in the opposite direction of the usual differential satisfying that b squared equals to b plus b squared equals to little b squared equals to zero. So the reason this is called, such an operator is called a circle action is because if we had a circle action on a topological space, that could be written as a map. So this is, if I had a topological circle action, and then if I wrote this at the level of uh, singular chains with respect to uh, the Kunas decomposition, I would get a map like this. And this guy is quasi-isomorphic to um, just uh, H0 of S1 plus H1 of S1. And this is, has a unique, um, it has a natural generator, which I call big B, okay? So if I have a space with a circle action, there is one way to take a chain on the space and turn it into a chain of one degree higher, simply by taking the um, orbit, uh, the, um, uh, the orbit of, the circle action on each point of the chain. And that increases chain degree by one. And this is my, you can check that it satisfies the conditions that I want. So I started now with, this is my input data. If I have a vector space, a DG vector space with a symmetric pairing and a circle action, now I'm going to, first of all, construct some new complexes. So the first complex I'm gonna construct is called V Tate, which is I adjoin a formal variable of degree minus two, and now I put my differential to be B, B plus U big B. This, might, this should be familiar to people studying uh, cyclic homology. This is a complex that computes periodic cyclic homology of an algebra. But this is a very general construction. Maybe to explain again the relationship, um, actually, let me not try to say what this means for homolo in, in topology. This is not so natural in topology yet. Now, this vector space has a pairing, which I will call the residue pairing. which is written like this. If I had, if I have alpha u to the i and I want to pair it with beta u to the j, I get either minus one to the i, the old pairing of alpha and beta, if i plus j equals to one or zero otherwise. So um, this is a very simple formula. This is the old pairing that I had. And this is now a new pairing that I'm defining. The old pairing only acted on pairs of elements from V. Now I've defined a new pairing on pairs of elements from V Tate. So with powers of U. Um, why is this um, pairing nice? So this makes my V Tate into a symplectic vector space. Um, maybe it's a little confusing what symplectic means because it's infinite dimensional, so I can't say anything about the non-degeneracy of the pairing. 
but at least it's Q symmetric. The, there's minus one to the I and the symmetry of the alpha beta uh, makes things symmetric, it's Q symmetric. I want to note here that this condition I plus J equals to one and not minus one is a little different from the com standard conventions in the literature. Turns out that the grading works a little better if I do things this way. There isn't any conceptual difference, but okay. This will be our old symplectic vector space that we had before in the non-DG case. It's, this will, this V tate will play the role of V from my previous discussion. Now, I'm going to take two, I need two Lagrangians, and I'm gonna take V plus to be U V bracket U, double bracket U, and V minus, will be V adjoined U inverse. So um, these are power series, if you want, in V with coefficients strictly positive, and V minus are the ones with non-positive non coefficients. So it should be clear that V tate is V plus plus V minus. And because of this condition that only things whose sum of the powers of U add up to one uh, can pair, these two are Lagrangians. So they are orthogonal Lagrangians. Great. So now we can completely repeat the construction that we had before. V plus with respect to B is a subcomplex of V tate with this differential B plus UB. So it's a subcomplex. So all the constructions that I did before for vector spaces, I can do them for the um, for DG vector spaces. So I can form the Weyl algebra of V tate. Just as before, I take the tensor algebra and I mod out by the, um, sorry, V tate divided by the relation X tensor Y minus Y tensor X. There are some signs here, but let me not worry about them. And I use the residue pairing, which is a natural pairing on V tate, to define this Weyl algebra. And uh, I have the left ideal generated by, um, by the uh, positive part. And I can take the quotient and form the Fock algebra which is W of V, W of V, V plus. Maybe to stick with my previous notations, let me call this F underscore V. So I construct this Fock module just as before, nothing very special. Here comes the really, counterintuitive thing to do. I would like to understand the homology of this FV. So I want to understand its homology. Before there was no differential, so I could not talk about its homology. But now I want to understand its homology. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna pretend that V minus is a sub sub um, space of V tate. This is correct as vector spaces or as graded vector spaces, but not as DG vector spaces. Notice that um, V minus is not closed with respect to the differential of, um, of V tate. 
the problem arises only at one spot. If I take some alpha u to the zero and I compute the differential b plus ub of this guy, then in v minus, I'm supposed to not get anything with power, positive power. So what I do is I kill off the positive power of u. So I just take b alpha times u to the zero. This big ub should give me to get take me into the u to the one, and that's not allowed. So I declare that to be zero. In fact, v minus is a is a quotient of v tate. It really is v tate mod v plus, right? So, but if I were computing in V tate, I was supposed to get B alpha times U to the zero plus big B alpha U to the one. So this is not a sub, sub DG vector space, but despite not being a DG vector space, I can still map as just vector spaces by the construction that I had before, seeing V minus, I can still map it to Fock of V, but I ignore the differential. And this will be an isomorphism just by the same result as before. So this is an isomorphism of graded vector spaces. It does not respect the differential. So not respect the differential. So if I wanted to understand this FV, one natural thing to do would be to take the differential from FV. I have a differential, an intrinsic differential because I've constructed this as a quotient of two DG vector spaces and pull it back by, the, um, by this isomorphism of graded vector spaces. So here's the theorem, which is a very easy exercise. So this is an exercise I would really, really recommend you guys trying before next time. The statement is the following, the pullback of the differential of FV. So FV itself has an intrinsic differential under the above isomorphism is of the form B plus UB plus H bar delta so here, maybe I had my H bar here. I forgot to put it in my previous discussion. Where this is the intrinsic differential on sim V minus. And this is a new, a new part of the differential where delta from sim um, V minus sim k v minus to sim k minus 2 v minus acts as delta of x1 times x k equals to summation <coughs> um, over all i less than j um, x1, xi excluded, xj excluded, xk times omega of xi, xj, where this omega of two elements, um, remember that xi and xj are in v minus, 
and I'll tell you what they do. Alpha u to the zero, beta u to the one, uh, be, be, uh, sorry, alpha u to the i, beta u to the j is equal to zero unless i equals to j equals to zero. And it's equal to the pairing of alpha and b of beta if i equals to j equals to zero. So I know I'm running over time. I started five minutes late. I'm going to stop in, in just 30 seconds. But the thing to remember what has happened here is that if I want to understand my, my DG vector space FV, which is a natural DG vector space that comes up in all these stories, it's completely equivalent to understand this symmetric algebra with this H bar in it. But the correct differential on that symmetric algebra is not its natural differential that comes from the differential of V minus, which would have been B plus UB. What it is, it picks up an extra term because this isomorphism is not an isomorphism of grade of DG vector spaces, picks up an extra term, but which is a very simple term it's a term which you should think of as taking a symmetric tensor, a product of k elements, and summing over all the ways to pick two of them, deleting them, and pairing them in this strange way, only when the u powers are zero, and when the u powers are zero, I'm pairing one of them with b of the other one. Incidentally, the big B must be, um, self adjoint so this is equal to b alpha and beta so it doesn't matter on which side you do it okay so i strongly strongly recommend you do this exercise if you can't do it you can find this this is a statement due to costello in his original paper it's an easy lemma um this would explain to you now what my Fock algebra is so this is my Fock algebra of V is now by definition, instead of taking that quotient, it's a quasi isomorphic thing, which is sim um, V minus adjoined H bar. I'm gonna adjoin this lambda variable also for, for good measure. Um, this is not, it's along for the ride, but with differential, this B plus UB, plus h bar delta. Okay? This is the end of my talk for today. Next time, we will try to understand the fact that this same thing makes sense on chains on moduli spaces. And um, this operator delta has a very nice, simple conceptual meaning in that setting. And the, then we're gonna write down the differential equation that we want. It's something called the quantum master equation for batalian vilkovsky algebras. The, I should have said that uh, now this guy has become a BV algebra with respect to this operator delta. And um, it's a very standard thing to solve the quantum master equation. The quantum master equation in the chains on moduli spaces will have a very nice geometric interpretation.